We're going to begin our foray into the realm of nonparametric methods with a review of the principles of statistical description and statistical inference. By review, I mean to say we will revisit concepts that you learned in your first statistics courses. What's going to be different is that we'll discuss these concepts in the context of our first non-parametric statistical methods. As someone who teaches the basic theory of statistical description and inference both in more traditional parametric statistics courses and when teaching non-parametric statistics, it always strikes me how much easier it is to teach and learn these concepts within a non-parametric context. This impression has been validated by students who have told me as much after they relearned, as it were, what they first learned in their statistics course. I am certain that you are at least somewhat familiar with these concepts. You may even have a sense of mastery with some of these, though others you may feel less certain about, depending on how many and what specific statistics courses you have taken. I predict that regardless of your level of understanding and comfort, that you will learn something new about most, if not all, of these concepts. That's because with many non-parametric methods, we can dispense with the idea of a mathematical model, the probability distribution, and focus on the potential outcomes in our study. This not only changes the way we think about description, and even more so inference, it can result in a deeper understanding of these principles applied to all types of statistics, parametric and non-parametric. Let's set aside as much complexity as we can for now and begin our study with the simplest possible response variable. That would be one that yields dichotomous data. These data are at the lowest level of measurement, that's sometimes known as the nominal level of measurement. And the data can only be categorized, and keeping it very simple, there are only two categories. One of the cool side effects of beginning our study with dichotomous data is that any response variable can be defined to yield dichotomous data. Consider a few of the incredibly long list of possibilities. In addition to keeping the response variable simple, we're going to employ the simplest explanatory variable as well. Our explanatory variable will be categorical with only a single category. This means we're employing one of two designs. Either we have a single sample of independent units or study participants, or we're creating a single sample by drawing on a covariate dependency and creating matched pairs using a measure of the pair rather than the individual as our response variable. The most common type of pair measure introduced in a first statistics course is the difference of the treatment participant score and the match control participant score. This assumes quantitative measurement of each participant. Focusing instead on a dichotomous measure of each pair opens a broad world of possibilities. Is the treatment participant of an identified pair more successful than the control participant? Yes or no? This can be a comparison of quantitative measures of the construct, but it may also include less precise assessment. For example, consider a study that includes raters comparing writing samples of a matched pair of participants. An analytic approach in which a score is derived using writing criteria is a reasonable approach, but an alternative, perhaps more efficient approach is for writing experts to make a holistic assessment regarding which of two writing samples is the best. Similarly, 
medical researchers comparing two treatments for, say, a skin rash, can make a judgment regarding which participant has experienced the most improvement after a specified amount of time. In general, the use of a dichotomous response variable provides great flexibility because we only need to make a judgment of whether the observation is this or that, whether we can say yes or no. We need only establish an expectation and can create any baseline. Perhaps the difficulty of implementing a particular treatment is such that we can only consider the treatment successful if it results in substantial improvement. If we define what we mean by substantial improvement, we have established a dichotomous outcome and can record an observation of successful or not successful for every pair. Our research hypothesis projects a successful treatment outcome. The evidence to support this hypothesis can be based on both description of our specific set of observations and inference about the expected outcomes in a broader arena that goes beyond what we observe. This latter inferential role necessitates that we develop a statistical alternative hypothesis to correspond to our research hypothesis. And my question for you is this. In a simple treatment control match pair study, what is that statistical alternative hypothesis? I'm going to pause for 30 seconds while you think about it. Produce an answer and say it aloud. Remember, a statistical hypothesis is based on a specified statistic that we can calculate from the data. So what is the statistical alternative hypothesis in a match pair treatment control design? You have 30 seconds. Time's up. If you said that the treatment will increase the mean of the response scores, give yourself a pat on the back for correctly recalling what you learned in the past about the match pair design. We can write the hypothesis as either the mean of the treatment is greater than the mean of the control, or because these are match pairs, we can take the treatment minus control, take that difference, and hypothesize that the mean of these differences is greater than zero. Yet what about a hypothesis like this? If the median of the scores increases, is that not also evidence of a positive treatment effect? Indeed, the median may be a better indicator of distribution center than the mean, because the mean is disproportionately influenced by distribution skew or outliers. Thinking more about what researchers really want to know about treatment effectiveness, perhaps we should expand our focus beyond distribution center. What about this hypothesis? Participants in the treatment condition will be more likely to score higher than those in the control condition. I suggest that if we probe regarding what researchers typically want to know about a treatment, the answer will be that it works. All these hypotheses suggest that the treatment works, yet this one is about the probability that the treatment will help an individual rather than about a shift in the center of the distribution. As you well know, a distribution center can shift even if most people are not influenced by the treatment. Speaking of which, we might state the hypothesis in terms of the number of participants who are positively influenced by the treatment rather than by the probability of a positive effect. The word most might be arbitrary. Perhaps we would like to know if at least 75% of the participants will be helped 
rather than most participants, which could mean just over 50%. The researcher is best equipped to define expectations. The research hypothesis should dictate the statistical hypothesis and the accompanying analysis and not the other way around. If you proposed the first of these statistical hypotheses, you can be applauded for remembering the statistical hypothesis to accompany a treatment control match pair design when using parametric methods. By contrast, any of these hypotheses, including the first one, can be tested using non-parametric methods. Why then is so much emphasis put on the first hypothesis in a traditional statistics sequence? The central limit theorem provides a rationale for using normal distribution theory and the sample mean for inference. Even when we do not know the shape of the underlying population distribution, the CLT guarantees that if we make enough observations and calculate the mean of these observations, that the mean comes from a normal distribution. In addition, a beautiful tapestry connects methods based on the mean and deviations from the mean through least squares regression. The standard deviation, the t-test, analysis of variance, sums of squares, the coefficient of determination, all of these statistical concepts and many more are founded in normal distribution theory. And then there's a long history of methods research and instruction that is focused on normal distribution theory. And thus, there is an accompanying inertia in professional disciplines. Researchers use the methods they were taught, and methods researchers continue to develop the methods that are most often used by applied researchers. Journal articles feature the same methods, and reviewers are most comfortable with these methods. It's a cycle that has become cemented with time. And then when you add to that the myths regarding competing methods, such as the belief that parametric methods are always more powerful than non-parametric methods, and we find ourselves with a clear, albeit unsatisfying answer about why so much emphasis is placed on statistical hypotheses that may or may not get directly at what the researcher is hoping to discover. The research hypothesis must be the motivation for the statistical hypothesis and analysis, not the other way around. We should use our data to answer the questions that we want to answer rather than questions that are motivated by any particular statistical theory. Don't let the tail wag the dog.